basically what I want to do is, is talk about not only um, some of the techniques that we use to analyze a project, but also some of the issues that we've uh, identified recently uh, as we've gone to try to find uh, various forms of finance for the project. And as a sort of as a, a preface to the entire uh, talk, what I'd say is, is that um, when you start looking for public finance of various types, uh, either uh, when I say public, I mean multilateral banks or any of the uh, large investment firms, what you'll find today is, is that it's not quite as easy to uh, finance projects that have uh, the word coal in them. Uh, this is unfortunate and it's uh, short-sighted. So one of the strategies that uh, we've developed uh, for other projects is to make sure that they're coupled as a part of a bigger process. Um, so anyway, uh, today, what I want to do is uh, first start with this outline of the presentation. It's simple. I want to talk about project planning and the te techno-economic studies or feasibility studies. Uh, social and environmental impacts that uh, have to be discussed, recognized, and uh, uh, talked about if you're going to look at finance from any of the sources that uh, we're going to discuss. Uh, project participants' responsibilities. Uh, this is something that's important to uh, financiers because they want to know who it is that's actually going to be responsible for doing uh, what activities and what kind of experience the project team has. And then finally, uh, some things about project financing, uh, sources that are available today, and, um, and what types of challenges you might meet looking at, at uh, various sources. Um, Clark quickly talked about some of the project planning and, uh, and the feasibility work that was done, and he skipped over some things because he was being nice to me, but he should have probably given those slides because, as I said earlier, those are um, uh, documents that actually result from a project that's in operation. This is the other side. This is a project where we've done the exploration work, we've done uh, a lot of reservoir simulation and a lot of planning, uh, but uh, it's yet to be executed. Uh, it's important that uh, that there's a clear outline for an implementation plan, even in the beginning, even as you're just beginning your, your uh, initial study, you can't really do the study uh, unless you have an idea of how the project is gonna actually operate. So you have to describe the business structure, um, explain how licenses will be obtained if you haven't obtained all of them yet, and how much time is needed, because uh, progressively in most countries, uh, time from uh, project uh, discussion through actual implementation is, uh, is there is a quite a lag in there. There is a, a delay. Um, agree on a funding plan, even if it's a rough agreement, it's still important uh, to be able to balance the uh, project needs versus uh, the funders and the timeline associated with getting the project up on its feet and finding the funding and how that funding is gonna be input into the project. Of course, secure outside funding. Try to do that in the initial stages because it is probably the more difficult uh, part of the project. Uh, apply and obtain uh, necessary environmental uh, permits and other permits such as uh, if it's a large drilling project, you're gonna need uh, permits for each of the drill sites. Uh, construction, rights of way, and surface rights of permanent facilities. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with uh, some of the news that's been uh, taking place in the United States, but even though uh, some projects have had uh, long-standing uh, permits and so forth, there's always an opportunity, at least in uh, our society, to challenge those, uh, those permits and challenge the rights of way. Um, the next is to contract service companies and equipment providers. And if you're not directly contracting them in the early stages of the project, it's really important uh, to know if those vendors uh, exist in the country that's uh, hosting your project, and if not, uh, feed into your overall plan uh, just how long it's gonna take to get pieces of equipment. Um, and the case that, uh, one of the cases that we're dealing with right now 
that is a significant part of, uh, of the timeline is getting those equipment ordered and uh, shipped to the site. Uh, you begin execution of exploration and development program absolutely as is, is, uh, early in the stage as possible. Establish offtake agreements or letters of intent with the ability to come back and uh, execute those agreements as you move forward. Uh, depending on what type of end use you intend to have, either electricity or gas distribution project, uh, deal with those companies and have a full understanding of what their needs, desires, and constraints might be. And then undertake uh, the full field development and construct offtake facilities, which of course is uh, the important part that, that gets uh, things where they need to be before you start flowing cash. Um, the techno, uh, techno economic analysis is really a feasibility study, obviously, and it's, it's uh, really to determine just what it sounds like. Is it technically and economically feasible to undertake this project? And uh, as scientists and engineers, we've all seen projects that are technically feasible, but economically, unfortunately, just like the example that uh, Clark gave about the ventilation air methane, uh, because of uh, a, a failing uh, carbon credit market, it made it impossible. Um, what will the source of fuel be? Will it be uh, coal mine methane or will it be coal bed methane or both? Will it be a conventional natural gas uh, product or is it unconventional? Now, uh, clearly here in Poland in the discussions that we'd had earlier today, we're talking about uh, coal mine methane. But if you look at the definition for, for uh, pre-mine drainage, that means uh, drainage from the surface under the United Nations uh, Framework Convention for Climate Change, what you'll see is that they talk about that pre-mine drainage as CBM, which is confusing because there are also standalone CBM projects that have nothing to do with mining. Um, and so you'll need to be clarifying that as you discuss with uh, bankers or finance groups. Uh, what are your end use options? What are the risks? that you may run into and what are the mitigants, what's the life of the project versus the evaluation period because obviously project life may be quite long, it might be several decades, but for your evaluation period and because you're constrained by the project projections that you can make in terms of cost and revenues, you have to be looking at a, a shorter window. Uh, when will the project start to flow cash? Uh, clearly account for the permitting, procurement, and installation of equipment. Uh, make sure that everyone knows what the delays are and what you're expecting. Then propose the ratio of loan to equity. Uh, finance groups are always going to want equity, and of course, uh, you're going to want to borrow as much as you can so that you can leverage the project uh, and balance those in such a way that everybody can agree and, and uh, move forward. And then the economic performance. Will it support the debt burden and flow cash to partners? And this is not just a strategy that you have to develop in terms of uh, pure economic sense, but also the fact that banks have their needs as well. And although they may be willing to lend you the money, it may be in a time frame that you have to uh, accept, and it may be early in the project, usually as early in the project. So for this uh, example, um, these are essentially pre-mine uh, drainage wells. They're drilled annually for 15 years for this evaluation period, but in actuality there would be many more wells and the production would go way past that 15 years. But as you'll see as we go forward, this is uh, designed so that the wells are drilled, the production comes online, and you're able to support uh, power production facilities for the longest period of time under stable production uh, scenarios. When we compared um, uh, for, this, for this example, when we compared the economic performance indicators for in-use options, we had to, there was a power uh, generation and there's a natural gas sales project. Uh, the natural gas sales project, as you can see, uh, substantially outperforms the uh, power generation project, but um, there are some issues with, with uh, both of them, and uh, just for, the, for today's discussion, I picked the power generation project because it has more issues that we can discuss, and I'll show you those as we go through. So this is, uh, this is a, a schedule of capital needs and capital disbursement. 
uh, the green line, oh, I don't know what color that is here, but sort of green color, uh, is actually the, the, the annual production of gas um, in, in cubic feet. And then uh, these bars are showing the capital needs total here in the blue part, and then this lower part is the amount that is proposed to be borrowed. So the total need of uh, capital input into the project over a 15 year period is about $227 million. Um, there are two aspects of this that, that I think many of you are aware of, but it's important to discuss, which is, one is, is that, of course, you have to have a strong partner. And often the early loans to the project that you might be able to arrange are based on your strong partner's uh, balance sheet. So those are really actually loans to that company, which they then in turn disperse to the uh, project. But after the project is up and running and you can prove that it actually has performance capabilities, then you're able to do project financing. So balancing that time period and making certain that you can make these, uh, these, these loans uh, overlap in such a way that you can keep the project going, uh, particularly if you're dealing with, uh, with an ongoing mining concern, and you heard many of the things that, uh, that Clark talked about, you really do have some challenges, and so this has to be thought through carefully, and you have to be ready to disclose every dirty little secret that you might have as you start to talk to the bankers. Um, lenders often require a substantial portion of the debt dispersed in a small number of tranches early in the project, usually over two or three years. Well, what that means is, is they want to give you the money as early as possible so they can start making some money off the money that they loan you. And of course, your problem is, is that you're trying to get a project up and running and flowing cash as quickly as possible so you can start to pay off some of those loans and actually flow cash to the partners and to, and to yourselves so that you can actually make it make money. So there are some challenges built into the, to the way it's uh, structured. One of the things that you'll see and hear about early on when you're developing your strategies for finance are the, the risk and mitigants. Uh, this first one, the first slide, I'm going to talk about the technology, and it has to do with the reliability and dependability of the equipment and technology. In the case that we're talking about, uh, because uh, we're using the kind of equipment that you just heard uh, uh, Clark uh, talk about, is that uh, that is that's off the shelf, virtually equipment and technology. So the assessment for that risk is low, and there's not any substantial mitigants needed, other than making sure that you get the right equipment on site and the right timing. When we talk about market access and the risk factors, this is a little bit more uh, complex and a little bit more nuanced. Um, if we're talking about just access to the natural gas market, the assessment is, is that it's moderate. Uh, mainly that's because uh, pipeline transport is, uh, in, the, in, the, in this particular example case, is building a pipeline into the region, a second one, but as we look out into the future, one of the issues is will it have the, the capacity? Because as we're developing our project, there are other projects that are being developed, and the question will be is who gets the most gas to the pipeline first, and what do you do if the pipeline's full? Um, so this is something that uh, will require more study. Access to the electricity market is actually low. Uh, and the reason for this is, is that there are a lot of uh, uh, power uh, production facilities in the region and there is uh, uh, easy access to, to the electric grid. However, one of the challenges is um, that there are a number of large hydroelectric power plants that are going to come on uh, line over the next few years. And one of the things that it might be implying is, is that the price of electricity is going to be low. However, if you look at the uh, hydroelectric power plants that are existent now in that country, you'll see they haven't performed to install capacity in a number of years because of a drought. And if we look at climate change and the predicted patterns, this is liable to persist. So it may be difficult to convince the banker that that's the case, but it is probably the case that uh, there will be additional electric power needs in the country as a number of brownouts, uh, even today. Uh, finally, uh, looking at the implementation, uh, the risk that you 
that you face are fluctuation of pricing, procurement of permits, delays in project development, uh, maybe drilling problems and, and deliverability of equipment, and delays in installation. For the most part, the assessment for each of these, as you can see, is moderate to low. Um, there are some issues uh, in some countries, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, but some of the permitting requires that you get, um, you actually get, in, in this case, um, a consensus from the inhabitants of the surface. Um, in this country, there are indigenous peoples that you have to, to talk with, and there is a very formal way of addressing that. I'll say also uh, in a different country, in China, the surface owners, particularly if they're farmers, uh, have uh, extremely well-protected rights to their farmland. And so even drilling a hole from the surface into the coal mines is very, very difficult. And this has caused uh, some, some issues with actually making some projects uh, perform to the, to the uh, level that they should. I'll obviously, surface, um, surface development may interfere with what you intend to do for your coal mining or for gas drainage. Uh, this is the phases of implementation, and I won't go through all the steps, but there's a preparation phase. Uh, this is where you're conducting environmental impacts, uh, submitting the EIA, securing other needed permits, etc. An exploration phase where you're contracting with service companies, drilling the initial pilot holes, uh, using reservoir simulation and uh, projecting what your production is going to be, fine-tuning how you're actually going to drill and produce those wells, and then begin to do that, making certain that all along you have your production licenses in place and begin the procurement for the large chunks of equipment that you're going to need as you start to develop your project. And finally, production phase, where you go into full swing commercial production, uh, adopting or adapting to uh, the full field development plan that you have to have uh, generated at this point, uh, contract service companies uh, and actually do what you said you're going to do and start drilling wells. And then for coal bed methane, which of course is an unconventional energy uh, project, you're essentially doing something that becomes akin to well manufacturing. So you're drilling a lot of wells, and so a lot of it has to do with planning of, of and positioning of your drilling well, your well drilling equipment and your gas gathering system. The social and environmental impacts. The social dimension, you have to address and accommodate local and regional social issues. Uh, you know, you have to realize that not everybody's going to perceive your project as having a positive, uh, positive impact. Some will believe it's, it's a negative impact, and in fact, there's been a number of studies that have shown that depending on which groups, you can be looking at the same, what we would call the same set of facts, but you'll get very different reactions. And you have to deal with those if you're a project developer. You have to have people that are very competent and capable to help you with those negotiations. Uh, there can be issues in certain countries with indigenous peoples. They have their rights and they have their concerns. And of course, this is something that is a reality and it's something that's right, but it's something that will also uh, take a lot, of, uh, a lot on the part of the developer. And then climate change. One of the ways that, uh, that climate change is impacting the whole finance um, uh, system now is, is that uh, life cycle cost analysis is often required. Uh, so even in the early stages uh, where we are in this project, we have to have gone through a fairly detailed study, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment here. One of the other things is the range of employment opportunities. And I won't go through this table, but this is uh, essentially uh, our analysis of how many jobs will be created in the lifetime of this project. And uh, depending on the, the technique that's being used, like a lot of social science type approaches, there are different approaches and they yield different numbers. Um, but the, the work that we did is would show that between 143 and 474 jobs would be created during the least active drilling year, and between 429 and 1,422 jobs would be created during the most active drilling years. Uh, again, that's, that's uh, 
built on the analysis that uh, we know is sound, but it's also a projection. But these are important because this means something to the local governments, the regional governments, and of course the federal government. Life cycle cost analysis, so the purpose is really to identify environmental impacts that occur throughout the life cycle of a naturally gas, uh, and in this case a natural gas based energy project. Uh, to quantify the impact to the extent possible and to estimate the cost to mitigate the impacts. And finally, to summarize the cost of the project as designed and compare options for energy project development. Uh, the block flow diagram for the life cycle of this project looks like this. And what I'll show you is, is that this is the project boundary. All of the things that uh, activities and uh, uh, systems that, that are inside that boundary we have to look at what that life cycle will do, what the cost will be, and how it impacts the environment and how we can mitigate it. The results is, is this. And so if we look at uh, what the cost is on a per well basis or on a cost per cubic meter of gas, or we also did one that went a little bit different direction and looked at it in terms of kilowatt hours. What you can see is, is that this is the cost per well. And when we look at the overall cost per well and then the total cost of dealing with, with each of these um, activities and mitigants, so we take a green well completion, meaning that we uh, lose as little gas as possible to the environment while we're drilling and completing, uh, water gas separation and making sure that we recycle water, uh, use indirect heaters so that we uh, get uh, as much of the water out of the systems as possible and then the best recovery of gas, gas gathering, metering, electric compressors, water treatment, water transpiration, transportation, flaring, and soil conservation, you can see those costs add up. But the interesting part about the project was is that when we take all of those, those mitigants and we look at them at the, uh, against the overall cost of the project, they really only make up a few percent of the cost of the project. So it's actually uh, possible to, with some planning and some additional expense, actually do a very good job of reducing the amount of environmental impact a project this size would make. So it's something that's very encouraging. And when you hear people or companies say that it's just too costly to do certain things, particularly things like uh, green well completions, you look at $55,000 a well, when you're talking about the individual costs of the wells that we're talking about here are about $1.8 million. I won't say that $55,000 is inconsequential, but it's not huge. The other thing that, that's interesting is, and of course uh, today I'm here representing uh, the United Nations as, as uh, many of us are, but what I'll say is, is that the sustainable development goals are now embedded in the analysis that uh, many of the multilateral uh, lending facilities um, require. And so when we make our presentations to these banks and we talk about each of these goals, it's not like we're talking about things that they don't understand. In fact, they do understand the sustainable development goals and they are expecting us to talk about them and prove that they can actually be satisfied. And so this is a list of some of the goals that uh, impact our, our project. And then there are project development matrix. You know, what is this project gonna do? Not just for the project itself, but for the overall impact. How is it going to further uh, this country and this region's uh, uh, development metrics? And so we're looking at project infrastructure, technology transfer, capacity building, uh, also policy development that needs to be done uh, to enable projects of this to do uh, what they intend to do, but also make sure that uh, other interests and stakeholders are protected. And then any kind of environmental improvements. In the case of our area, we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, not just simply because uh, we're using natural gas, but because this coal is gonna be mined and we're making sure that before that gas is, or before the coal's mined, the gas is out. So project participants' responsibilities, they're pretty clear, the project hosts uh, in our case is marketing, gas and electricity, helping with the host country, uh, resource licensing and permitting and funding. 
And our side, we will operate with uh, some of our partners and consortium as the EPC and do the engineering procurement and construction, project management, project implementation, and funding. So what are some of the finance options? In the few minutes that I have left, there are the two sides of it, the equity side, in this case, the host organization, but also the project developer. The project developer, at least in our case, can be uh, assisted by uh, and has been by GMI and also U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Or there are equivalents in other countries, such as uh, NIDO in Japan, and I know a lot of countries uh, also have the same kinds of organizations that want to promote trade and development of goods and services from, um, from various uh, uh, project developers in their host country. And then finally, outside, uh, or not finally, but outside equity and investors and partners. In other words, this is that key amount of early money that's so important that you have to raise and get into position to do it. And then carbon finance. And although we're probably in some cases at a low point in carbon finance, and of course there's uh, some issues in, in our country that, uh, uh, that uh, recent uh, activities have caused uh, some doubt about carbon finance, there are also bright spots, uh, particularly at state and city level in the United States and certainly in other countries. So carbon finance is not something to be ignored even if it's a little bit less than optimum at this point. Uh, when we talk about debt, there are the obvious uh, groups, the World Bank Group, uh, and there's a subsidiary um, uh, or members of the bank group family, uh, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, very active in a number of parts of the world, multilateral investment guarantee agency. This is important because if you're working in a country that has country risk associated with it, this is a way to essentially have an insurance policy so that you're able to go ahead and operate or at least recover some of your money if there's a problem in the country. And then the International Finance Corporation, which is different than the others because it actually lends money to companies, not just countries. Obviously, if you're working in Asia, you should be talking to the Asian Development Bank. And now there's a new player, which uh, many of you are aware is the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which is a bank that will be uh, is being funded by China and a number of uh, other countries, which is going to add some competition to uh, the work that the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank um, are involved in. There are regional development banks. Uh, there are banks that are, that are in a sense, uh, based just over uh, or around a certain number of countries and uh, are focused on activities that are required for sustainable development in those countries. Um, in the United States, we're, we have an overseas private investment corporation, which helps uh, small development uh, and, and large development uh, projects by uh, lending money at uh, very competitive rates, but also, also has a form of guarantee associated with it that's very, very helpful uh, if you find yourself in problems or discussions in a country that you're not able to handle by yourself because there is the help of, uh, in, the, in this case with OPIC, uh, the U.S. government to come to bear. Commercial banks, uh, both in the host country and the developer's country, uh, that these are substantial projects and at the point that, uh, that you're actually producing uh, energy and, uh, and selling it, uh, this is something that, um, that you can look at. Uh, commercial banks, I think, are something that uh, we talked about a long time ago that um, I think it was Mark Twain who said that uh, or banks are always there when you don't need them, meaning that you've already gotten to the point where you don't need banks, but they're certainly there to lend you the money that you don't need any longer. And uh, so, and then finally, the host country because there are a number of funding opportunities depending on the country that you're in. So that was a whirlwind uh, tour of some of the issues that you face as a project developer looking for uh, developing uh, projects and uh, finding ways to get it financed. And uh, I'd be glad to entertain uh, questions that uh, arise based on this um, presentation. And of course, I'll be around there the rest of the day. Thank you very much.